Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Uh, we're in chapter 4. Remember, we left Paul over in, um, um, let me see here. I think we left Paul over in, Paul had gone over to Macedonia. In, uh, down, I think he's back actually over in Corneth writing this. He's sitting there writing to the church at Rome. And uh, we've only gotten through four chapters in about the past eight weeks. So uh, we haven't got through, eight, through the eighth cha eight cha fourth chapter. So we are in the middle of the fourth chapter. I believe we kind of ended up last week um, around verse 12. And uh, so we'll just kind of pick up around verse 12 and the, you know, verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness, of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though he, he be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to them who were not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had been uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be heir, uh, that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Because the law worketh wrath, for where, there no law, where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end. So it's by, it's by faith, that it, it's, it's through faith, or of faith, that it might be by grace to the end. In other words, the faith that releases the grace has an end in, 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 in sight, an end purpose, an end uh, plan. <clears throat> the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now remember, when Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, he said, and, and said, you know, uh, it was not to Abraham and his seeds as of many, but his seed as of one, which is Christ. And he goes on in that same chapter, in about the 28th verse, it says this, and if you be Christ, possessive, then are you Abraham's seed, singular, and heirs according to the promise. Okay? And since we're studying this chronologically, we know Paul hadn't written Galatians yet. Meaning that, you know, he expands upon what we're saying right here. Therefore it is of grace that it might be, I mean, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Then when he writes to the church of Galatia, he expounds or expands that line of thought and brings clarity to it in that, you know, the seed is Christ, and if you're in Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. So it's not to those of the law, but also to that which is the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I've made thee the father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. Now, I really like Weymouth's translation of this verse. Um, and he says here, who makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. Okay? God makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. Why? Well, he just calls things into being. See, we're to live that kind of lifestyle. Now, who against hope, believed in hope, or as uh, I think Weymouth also says, under utterly hopeless circumstances, he hopefully believed. Well, aren't you, aren't you glad that when we're in utterly hopeless circumstances, we can still have hope and, and, and get into faith and get things done? Amen? I said amen. Hallelujah. And so, who, who when under her utterly hopeless circumstances, hopefully believe that he might become the father of many nations. Now, in his case, think about it now. In his case, the utterly hopeless circumstance was he was 100, his wife was 90. That's pretty much hopeless. I mean, I, I went with Janie numerous times to the, to the uh, OBGYN when she was carrying, you know, the kids. And I never once in all those years watched and saw a 90-year-old woman come in or go out. Not pregnant. Hello. 
<clears throat> now, that was an utterly hopeless circumstance. God had made a promise to Abraham that, that this, it would not be the seed that came through the bondwoman, but his wife Sarah would conceive. And under utterly hopeless, I'm going to tell you something. God told, told me a couple weeks ago, he said, everything's all right. Everything's going to be all right. It's all going to work out okay. And I'm, I looked at that and thought, it's utterly hopeless. Without that word to spring hope, for faith to lay hold of, there is, there's nothing to do. I mean, you just kind of sit and go, oh, my God. But thank God. I said, thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Notice what he goes on here and says this. Who, uh, who un, uh, under utterly hopeless circumstances, remember we're quoting Weymouth here, he hopefully believed that he might become, now I'm going to flip back over to King, King James, that he, might, that he might become the father of many nations, so that uh, to that which was, uh, I'm sorry, according to that which was spoken. According to that which was spoken. Abraham was able in the midst of utterly hopeless circumstances to have a hope spring forth. Remember, now remember, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things what? Hoped for. You don't have any hope, there's nothing for your faith to give substance to. In other words, let's say it this way. You could have the faith that would move mountains and, and, and put trees and oceans and all kinds of stuff, but if you have no hope of something, there's nothing for it to give substance to. It is a force with nothing to be acted upon. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You lay hold of the hope. When God speaks to you by his word or speaks to you by his spirit, and he'll always speak to you by his spirit in line with his word. You, see, you, don't, you don't get to have he spoke to me by his spirit that's out of line with the word. It doesn't, forget that one. You know, there are people saying that kind of stuff today. You know, I, I've got a word from the Lord. That, you know, it's not in the Bible. And it's not in line with the Bible, but it's, it's from God. And that's more important because I've got a revelation. If you've got a revelation, you can't prove out with the word, you better check where you got your revy from. It might have come from the Debbie. It's a Debbie revy. <laughs> Amen. Are you here? You're going home. We don't need Debbie revies. We need righteous revelation. Amen. What's righteous revelation? Righteous revelation would be revelation that comes from God's word or God's spirit. But remember, in the book of John, 1 John, I believe it is, he said that the Word and the Spirit agree. They're not in disharmony. So God's not going to give you a revelation. You're going to get somebody else's wife when that wife is married to another man. That's a Debbie Revy. You're going to have me a whole series. The Debbie Revy. All right. Is it a heavy Revy or a Debbie Revy? I'm going to have fun with that one. All right. Notice, under utterly hopeless circumstances, he hopefully believed how? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Abraham was able to have a hope of an answer or a hope of a miracle. Now, remember, you've got to have the hope first because God spoke a word to him. And then he laid hold of that hope, how? By faith, and brought it to pass. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When Abraham was a hundred, now remember, he lost hope. Think about it, you go study Abraham. About 13 years or so, or, or somewhere in that neighborhood after God had appeared to him when he was 75 years old, and said, to get thee out of that country, out of that kindred, out of thy father's house, and, I'll eat, and go into a land that I will show you. <clears throat> and he takes off, and of course he doesn't obey, quote, completely obey. He takes Lot with him. He wasn't supposed to take Lot. Lot causes him some problems. Right. See, when you don't obey God, it causes you problems. I'm under grace. If you don't obey God, you're going to have problems. I'm under grace. If you don't obey God, you're, you're going to have problems. I don't care how much grace you're under. When you walk in disobedience, you're going to have problems. You want to sow the wrong, you know, I, you, can, you can call a grace all day long and let me check up on you in about three or four years. 
right now in the euphoria of everything, and you just kind of think, you know, and you just kind of got your head in the sand, seeing a drop kick me Satan through the goalpost of life. But eventually, disobedience is going to catch up with you. It didn't look like, let's think about this. Go study Abraham and Lot. <clears throat> See, if you start looking at circumstances, you'll think when Abraham and Lot went out, that they were in obedience. I mean, God was blessing them even though God told him not to bring him. Why? Their, their increase was so great between them, the land could not bear the two of them. So from the natural, it looked like, man, these guys are just walking in the blessing of God. No, Lot was walking in the blessing overflow of Abraham. But because of his heart and because of the heart of his wife, God, you know, Abraham went, you know, said, we got to divide this up. We can't keep doing this. What did they do? They took the best land closest to town. And before long, they ended up in town. And before long, God came down and saw the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he says, shall I hide the thing that I'm about to do, you know, from Abraham? Why, he, he made a covenant with Abraham. So he goes down and tells Abraham, I'm getting ready to wipe him out. I'm taking, yeah, but Lot's in there, so he starts arguing his case. Gets God down from 100 down to 10. And, um. And at the 10, I'll, I'll be honest with you, if he had stopped, if he said, will you spare it for, for Lot's sake, we would have never had the, 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 the cooking of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. He stopped short. And then he basically asked God, can I get Lot out? Now, Lot was so tainted by the sin around him that when the angels came, um, the men of the city came, because it was a homosexual city, and wanted the angels to have relations with, because they were male, male, and Lot offered his daughters, what kind of pervert father offers his daughters to a mob? The Bible says that he lived there, and he was, his righteous soul was vexed daily. Now, you may think you can live in some kind of bubble in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation and not be where you're supposed to be, and it won't affect you. But I'm going to tell you, it will vex your righteous soul daily. The Bible still says, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Well, Jesus ate with publicans and sinners. He ate with them. He did not live with them. And he was there on a ministry mission, not a you know, let's hang out and go to the bar together mission. He was there to bring light in the midst of darkness. But, the, you know, after that, he left and went back to his group. And throughout the book of Acts, when, you know, the disciples would go out and minister, but then they would go back to their own company. Why? Because they needed to get back and pray, and they needed to get charged back up so they could go into a dark world and minister light. But they weren't hanging with them. They weren't going Calabanga or whatever. You know, I, I know that's old, old. That's the last thing I remember being hip before I, after I got saved. And it was, a, anyway, we'll leave that one alone. Now, all my peeps that may be watching me from my age there understand. Now, look at here. Yeah, I bet you all hadn't heard that one in a long time either. Look at here. I'm on, the, I'm, on, I'm on the old roll here. It says, who against hope, believe in hope, or under utterly hopeless circumstances, hopefully believe that he might become the father of many nations. Why? According to that which was spoken, what was spoken? So shall thy seed be. God gave him a word. But somewhere in there, Abraham lost hope. God had to come out and reiterate that word again. You look around the time 13 years later, about 87, his wife comes to him and says, Abe, Hadn't had any kids yet. Um, you know, she, he's 87. That makes her about 77. She's 10, Sarah's 10 years younger. And she's given up. Hagar is my handmaiden. Now, let me just make it real plain. Go have sex with her and have some kids. By proxy. Abraham, well, baby, I just can't do it. I love you, baby. God's given us a word. The Lord's given us a word. We're going to keep with the word of God. We're going to have the baby we're supposed to. It's going to be a supernatural miracle. What does the next thing say? And Abram hearkened to the voice of his wife, Sarah. 
He said, yo, I am Pepe Le Pew and she's the cat. <laughs> My little chickadee here. Anyway, there's no argument from Abram. We have no record of one word of argument. You can have her with my blessing. Woo! Boom. I don't care who it is. If they disagree with what God said, you don't listen to it. And your husband or your wife may be your closest confidant, but there's one you obey above them, and that's God. Had he not hearkened to the voice of his wife, Sarah, we wouldn't have a lot of problems around the Persian Gulf we have right now. Hello. Thank you for your enthusiasm. But he hearkened. And then when God shows back up, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, Walk well, before me, be thou perfect. Remember that? He says, for I am the almighty God. Yeah, I'm El Shaddai. That's what we get, you know, that happens here. And then, he, and then he begins to talk to him about, you know, his seed. And Abraham, or Abram at the time, goes, he says, oh, the Ishmael, or not Ishmael, um, yeah, Ishmael might live before you. And, and he, remember, now if you go back, you remember um, around, around um, 87, he said, there's only one in my house. He said, that's the steward's son, Eleazar. And so you couldn't have the steward's son be in the heir. So they go in with my handmaid, and he'll be a legal heir, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Because God, God just ain't on the timetable like we're on. We're getting old. You know, it doesn't matter. I said it doesn't matter. We have, we have Bible recordings of words of God that were fulfilled posthumously. Elijah, or Elisha. Asked for a double anointing or a double portion of the anointing. And in his living on the earth lifespan, he worked, thir uh, Elijah worked seven miracles, major miracles that we have recorded. Elisha had 13. He died without being a double. But the word was that he would have double. So we, people need to study this out. Y'all getting, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. And so they bury him. His bones, the flesh rots off his bones and decomposes. There are bones and ain't nobody, ain't no skin on them bones. There are bones in that sepulcher. We don't know exactly how long it was. But sometime after the complete decomp decomposition of his flesh and his organs and all the skin, just bones left down in the sepulcher. There's a battle going on. See, God's word and God's promise is sure and true. I said God's word and God's promises is sure and it is true. Can I say it one more time? I said God's word and God's promise is sure and it is true. And so, our, so, so Elijah, Elisha died having worked 13 miracles. Elijah worked seven. We're one short of the double portion. But there's a battle going on a number of years later. And they're running around, and, and one of their guys gets killed. They don't have time to bury him. The enemy is in hot pursuit. So they just pick him up. They run out of this open sepulcher. You know, now, that's the guy I tell you, it's old if it's opened up. The age calls it, you know, the earth to crack, whatever, and, and, and there was opening there. And they just, well, there's a grave, and threw him in. And he rolls down and comes in contact with those bones. Let me tell you what he really came in contact with. He came in contact with a promise, the sure and the true word of God, hallelujah. Because Elisha, ask of Elijah, he said, you know, you know, Elijah finally got, got started going, I say, I say, boy, you bother me. What do you want? And Elijah said, I want a double portion of what you got. He said, if you see me when I go up, you get it. Speaking by unction of the Holy Ghost, it had to be a prophecy. 
And he, man, he hung on tight. He wouldn't let him out of his sight. The chariot came, picked Elijah up. Elijah said, you know, talked about the angels of the Lord and the chariots thereof. And, and then his mantle, Elijah's mantle fell down. Elijah picked it up, went back to the river Jordan and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And slapped the water and then went hither and thither. And then all the sons of the prophets said, "Whoa!" The spirit that was on Elijah is on Elisha. But double. And for the rest of his life, he walked in this. And, and I don't know who, who was keeping record. You know, you know, maybe he had a little guy running around doing, you know, doing a newspaper report. There's one miracle. Elijah did seven. There's two. There's three. Seven. Oh, he's equal. He's got the equal anointing. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. He's dead. Up. So he didn't work. Hopefully he was around for the sepulcher event. Somebody was because we got it recorded. God's word is sure. God's word is true. God's word will come to pass. Look at Isaiah. I know we're in Romans. This is why it takes so long to do this. Because how can we not go back to Isaiah 55? Verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither. Don't you just love the king, Jimmy? But watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. Now he's given an allegory. As rain comes down and waters earth, it doesn't jump back up. Now eventually, as, as it goes to the tables and gets to the ocean, it evaporates, and then water comes back down again. But he's saying it doesn't rain and go back up, rain and go back up, rain and go back up. It does, so, it accomplishes something. When that water comes to the earth, it comes with a purpose, and its purpose is to water the earth to make it to bring forth in the bud. And just like that is so, and it gives seed to the sowing bread to the earth, verse 11 says, so shall my word be. In the same way that water comes out, rain comes out of the heavens with a purpose to water the earth, to cause it to bring forth in bud, to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Amen. It shall not return to me void. In other words, it shall not return to me without doing what I sent it to do. It stays until its mission is fulfilled. Now, you've heard this. Science, they've gone out with big, huge telescopes. They said, you know, that, you know, um, Astronomers, not astrologists, <laughs> astronomers said that the universe is expanding in every direction at the speed of light from a single point. Why? Because there was a word given, light be. He never told light to stop. It's still acting in obedience to God. Light be. Took off. From the single point, what? His mouth, that single point. It went out in every direction. It's still acting in obedience to God. And you need a healing scripture. Maybe God don't do that anymore. His word continues to do what he sent it to do. And one scripture says in the Old Testament, he sent his word and healed them. Glory to God. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void to who, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now what was it that pleases him with his word? Whatever he said it was. Whatever the word is, just like, you know, God's word is God's seed. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So Peter uh, uh, relates, or um, I hate to use allegorizes, but, but Peter equates seed, God's seed, with his word. 
So if you plant a tomato seed, do not expect to get corn. You will not get corn if you plant tomato seed. You will not get tomatoes if you plant green bean seed. You won't get cabbage if you plant collard seeds. And they're in the same family. Y'all hear? God's word is his seed. And so shall my word be. If it goeth forth out of my mouth, it will accomplish the thing that I please. Amen? And prosper in the thing whereunto I sin it. Whatever the scripture is, whatever the word is, whatever the seed is that you're reading, whatever it says, that is what kind of seed it is. Amen? So what? Does that mean? That means that whatever the seed is, if you'll, if you'll act on that and, and, and allow it to work in your life, it will accomplish what it was sent to do. If it's healing scriptures, it will accomplish healing. If it's prosperity scriptures, it will accomplish prosperity. And when I say prosperity, don't go around here and say, oh, he's one of them, name it, claim it, frame it, you know, lunatic, you know, prosperity. People know there's Bible, there's biblical prosperity. And there's crazy prosperity. What's crazy prosperity? You, only have, you can only give up and get blessed. You know, you got to get to a higher anointing. There's no Bible for that. The Bible tells us to take care of the ministers. The Bible tells us to bring the offering into the storehouse. There's different things that the Bible says, but it also says to lend to the poor is to give to the Lord. Amen. You're, you're up here, you're going to go give to bro, brother prosperity teacher, and God's wanting you to give to the person three rows behind you that's got a light bill due this week, or they're going to have the lights turn off, and their babies are going to be freezing in there in the winter, and you're going to go get up here and give to the higher anointing, and God's trying to get you back, get you, get you, get you, get you to wake up. No. Let's follow the word of God. That went over big. Go read the Midas Touch by Dad Hagen. It'll straighten you out. Isn't that right, Brother Bill? Yeah. For you shall go out with joy, be led forth with peace. The mountain and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Hallelujah. Instead of the thistle shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be the, uh, to the Lord for a name, an everlasting sign, and shall not be cut off. Notice again here that his word comes forth and accomplishes what he sent it to do. That's what we're after over there. Amen. Abraham believed God or under utterly hopeless circumstances, hopefully believed according to that which was spoken. We can go to God's word, the Bible, and say, I don't believe it's the Bible. That's your problem. I'm not even going to talk to you. Because it's either you take it as a matter of faith or you don't. And if you don't, then I can't help you. Honestly, I cannot help somebody who, re who rejects God's word as, 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 as the word of God. There's no, I can't help you. Like uh, a number of years ago, a couple came to our church, and they called, the, light, the lady called me up. She wants some marriage counseling. I thought, well, yeah, I'm young and dumb. You know, I, had to, I'll, well, I can help you. You can't help people who get up and start cussing and using God's name in vain and at each other and stuff right in the middle of your account. Ten minutes in. Uh, whoa, whoa. You can't do that. Not in my office. Now, maybe over, you know, Dr. So-and-so, uh, you know, secular degree on counseling, you can cuss and throw stuff and all that, but not in my office. Because what am I going to tell you? I'm going to tell you the Bible says this. When I talk to you as a husband and wife, I'm going to say, well, the, you, you, as a Christian, you need to do this, and as a Christian, you need to do that. Well, I don't believe the Bible. Then I can't help you. Well, that's not walking in love. Really? They that come to God must believe that he is, and he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you believe he is, you've got to believe his word is. You can't reject his word and expect help or, 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 or transformation. Amen. And being not weak in faith. I want you to notice two things here in these next couple of verses. Being not weak in faith. Underline that. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, we've gone over this. Different translations says he did consider. 
And what I, I honestly believe when the King James translators are trying to do this, they were trying to, to come across and let it be known that even in the midst of these contrary facts, it didn't affect his faith. They were trying to, you know, they were trying to say, but you, you know, it, sometimes uh, thing, languages become archaic or structures of language are archaic 400 years later or they don't, they don't work the same. Okay, Newton, other translations say he considered his own body now dead and the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he was not weak in faith. Okay, you can say it this way. In light of the, of the deadness of his body and Sarah's womb, he did not allow that to affect him and cause him to be weak in faith. That's what they're trying to say here. And other translations say it and, and, and without the negatives. They use it in, in, in different ways. But they're saying the same thing. Okay. So it's, it's, not a, it's not like it's mistranslation. It's the, the structure of you know, conveying what's trying to be said here. It was that he, didn't, he was not weak in faith because of the deadness of Sarah's womb you know, or, or the uh, weakness of his body. All right? It became a non-effect on him. Okay? Because, you know, you'll go pick up a different translation. Well, this says something different. Well, look at it in context. You see it's saying the same thing. All right? So being not weak in, in, his, in faith, what was he not weak in? What was he not weak in? So here, let me say this. If, you, if you're if being not weak in faith, means he could have been weak in faith. Right. Believers, you can be weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. It's not in here, but 90, 90 years old. <clears throat> he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. So he was not weak in faith, but he was strong in faith, gave glory to God. Next verse. And being fully persuaded, there you go. He, he, uh, that what he promised, he was able also to, to perform. Was he halfway persuaded? Was he partially persuaded? Was he two-thirds persuaded? Fully persuaded. What, what was he persuaded? What was it that Abraham had a persuasion about? That what God had promised, he was also able to perform. And remember, remember, under utterly hopeless circumstances, he hopefully believed according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. He says, so shall thy seed be. It was a promise from God. And because he had a promise from God, he believed that not only, was he, that not only did he promise it, he was able to perform it. And he was fully persuaded of that. There's an old country song back in the 70s or maybe 60s, I don't know. It's called Almost Persuaded. Almost persuaded, let strange lips lead me home. Let me say something here. If you was almost and you didn't, then you didn't. You wouldn't be singing the song because you'd be dead. Anyway, those country women are like, you know, like pull knives and dig their keys into the side of your souped up four-wheel drive and carve their names into your leather seat. I dug my keys into this. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Redneck women. Now listen to this. Verse 22. And therefore. Now what? What was it therefore for? He was fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. His righteousness was imputed after he was fully persuaded. He was not weak in faith. He was strong in faith. And his strength of his faith was in this fact that what he had promised he was able to perform. If what? Now wait a second now. When the, did the promise that he made that he was able to perform come into fruition? When Abraham believed. And that was imputed to him for righteousness. He had to be fully persuaded that what God promised he could do. 
and lay hold of that hope that what God promised he could do and bring it into reality, to the reality of actually manifested by his faith. God gave him a word. Hope came. He became fully persuaded that what God could, said he would do, he could do. And he laid hold of that promise by faith and summoned it in. How did he summon it? Your name shall no longer be Abram, but Abraham, the father of a multitude. I'm the father of many nations. He began to speak what was spoken. He came into verbal covenant agreement. And of course, there was obviously some action that went on. Let's get it on. Oh, come on now, guys. Now, you, you don't even get to do that. You walked off the dance floor and left your wife <laughs> right out there by herself going like a deer in headlight. Just walked off and left her. Therefore, because he came to this full persuasion, he came to this place where what, under utterly hopeless circumstances he hopefully believed, and because he was fully persuaded what he promised that he was able to perform, he laid hold in faith, and that was imputed to him for righteousness. And it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, the Lord, our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Glory to God. Everybody say glory to God. I said glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, Paul, in the first three chapters of this book, has included the Jew, the Gentile, the whole bunch under sin. And, you know, and the law's not going to, and then he gets into chapter 4 and starts in on how the law's not going to cut it. Law didn't make it. Took faith. And now it's a transition from being, a lot, being sold under sin, under the bondage of sin, into the lifestyle of faith. As um, Kenyon refers to it, faith righteousness. There's law righteousness and there's faith righteousness. Nobody can live law righteousness. You can't obtain it by the law. You can't do it. The law was given to be our schoolmaster. They're talking to the, Paul wrote this in Galatians to the Jews. Was given as a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. What? You're utterly hopeless in making, and you're, you're beyond utterly hopeless circumstances. You cannot achieve righteousness with God by fulfilling the law because you can't fulfill the law. It's impossible. And it was given to prove that. Jesus fulfilled the law. He's the only one who could. And because of that, we now associate with him our identification with him through faith in him, being washed in the blood and being baptized into the body of Christ. Now, I'm not talking about water baptism. I believe in water baptism, but, but the baptism into the body of Christ. Water baptism doesn't save you. It is, a, it is an ordinance of the church. It is to be obeyed. It does demonstrate a faith in Christ, your faith in Christ in symbolism, but it doesn't save you. By one spirit are we baptized into one body. Amen. Which I ought to tell you there's something different between that and being baptized by the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. The Holy, Jesus comes after me. The one comes after me is mighty, and I he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And then Paul writes to the church of Corinth and says, by one spirit we baptize into one body. Jesus, you get baptized into the body of Christ by Jesus, I mean by the Holy Spirit. You get baptized into the Holy Spirit by Jesus. You get baptized in water by men. They're all, there's, there's those, those are the three biblical baptisms in, in fire. New Testament baptism, fire, Holy Spirit, body of Christ, water baptism. Amen. Hallelujah. But now we're in Christ. And so Paul begins this, this transition over these next few chapters in, 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 in our new, you know, uh, in chapter 4, uh, justification, how it's explained. 
um, justification expected in Abraham. Then verse 5 will be justification experience. And then we're going to get into our position in Christ. Chapter 7, we will deal with. You know, the one where I would, I do that which I would not, but I would not do that which I would do. And da, 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 da. We're going to deal with that chapter. Let me make it real simple for you. It's the struggle between the new created man and the old flesh. The flesh will fight you every single stinking step of the way. Now, people who want, you know, you've got people who run around and say, well, it doesn't matter what we do with our bodies. We're going to heaven. You know, we're under grace. You know what? It's interesting that Paul writes to the church here in Rome when we get to the 12th chapter and says, offer your body a living sacrifice, which is, you know, King James says reasonable, but the Greek says your spiritual service. Offer your body a living sacrifice. You've got to keep that sucker nailed to the cross every day. Because if you let it off, it will mess you up. Now, I love to use Nathan as an example, but, you know, we could eat Danny's barbecue, you know, at the church once a year with the fried chicken and all that stuff, all the coleslaw, all the corn sticks, the whole deal. But if I, sometimes I, I'll, just, I'll, I'll grab a Boston butt and make it home, you know, and we'll just have, you know, some barbecue slaw and some potatoes. My son gives into his flesh. He knows it's going to hurt. Cap, cap's in on the deal. Now, he, they, they, now that he's moved out here and got a taste of it, he's in on the deal. <laughs> Eat it and just yield to the flesh, and their flesh takes over. Knowing you're going to pay the price in about an hour. Don't care. You don't get it often. It's so good, it's just going to hurt myself. Then he's laying on the couch, later going, oh, oh, what's wrong? I ate too much. Why'd you do that? Because it was good. You shouldn't have done that. No, it was worth it. <laughs> Hello? Well, willing to pay the price. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, PO Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.